Hey there, Amicus listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the Supreme Court and also the law of Donald J. Trump. And also, it's a podcast about what happens when each and every one of those subjects is a full-time raging house on fire. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover the courts and the law for Slate. And this week was busy at the Supreme Court in a dozen small ways, but at least as of this particular taping, not in the big Trumpy ways we've been looking out for. This week, we wanted to lift our necks out of at least some of the rising quicksand and talk to one of our favorite experts on the twin topics of democracy and despair. Professor Richard Hassan's latest book, A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy, was published this past week by Princeton Press. In it, he argues for enshrining an affirmative and immutable right to vote in the Constitution itself. Rick has been more or less on the friends and family plan here at Amicus from the jump, including his stint as co-host of Election Meltdown, a series we did dedicated to imagining what could possibly go wrong in an upcoming presidential election year all those centuries ago back in 2020. Rick is here today to discuss constitutional amendments, the Trump cases at SCOTUS, and to preview the forthcoming social media cases that will be heard at the court next week. Later on in the show, Slate Plus subscribers are going to get a chance to hear our members-only conversation between me and Mark Joseph Stern about some SCOTUS news this week, including a warning shot from Justice Samuel Alito about the future of marriage equality and a Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision on the Second Amendment. Mark also has some fairly chilling words about the implications of Alabama Supreme Court's unprecedented IVF ruling that came down last weekend. If you are not already a subscriber, but you'd like to listen in, head on over to slate.com slash amicus plus for details on how to become a member. Or if you're listening to us in Apple Podcasts, you can click try free at the top of our show page. And to our Slate Plus subscribers, thank you, thank you as ever for supporting the work we do here on the show and at the magazine. But now I want to welcome back my old friend, Rick Hassan, who teaches law and political science at UCLA. He directs UCLA Law's Safeguarding Democracy Project. He also helms the indispensable election law blog. And his new book, A Real Right to Vote, dropped this week. It argues for a desperately necessary constitutional amendment to protect the right to vote for everyone. His prior books include Election Meltdown, Cheap Speech, and The Voting Wars. And his writing appears pretty much everywhere that the right to vote is still prized in America. So welcome back, Rick, and congratulations on the new book. Well, thank you so much. When I was uh, giving one of my first book talks in Washington, D.C., I could see out of the corner of my eye the paperback of Lady Justice watching over me. So I felt uh, very good in my uh, talk with Jamie Raskin and Sherilyn Eiffel. Oh, nice. Well, no better way to launch. Um, I wonder if we can start with the news, Rick, and move to your book. And on the news front, our couple 
run us over. We're awaiting not one, but two vitally important intercessions from the U.S. Supreme Court on a pair of unrelated but kind of connected Trump cases. The first is the ballot disqualification case out of Colorado. The court heard that two weeks ago. The second is this blanket immunity uh, claim that is awaiting some kind of adjudication so that the January 6th trial that's been on hold in D.C. can sputter back into life. I wonder if you have any kind of top line thoughts about this kind of waiting for Godot, waiting, waiting, waiting moment that we're in right now. As the Supreme Court, which is thinking a little bit about its own legitimacy, also (laughs) weighs these potential game changing cases. So the first thing to say is that legally speaking, these two cases really have nothing to do with each other. One case is about whether Under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, Donald Trump is disqualified from serving as president because he participated in insurrection after taking an oath to uphold the Constitution. The other case involves whether or not a president has absolute immunity from criminal liability, even if the crime he's accused of is trying to steal the next election. Those two things are not directly legally related, but They're before the court at the same time, and as I wrote in Slate a few weeks ago, it's easy to see a kind of political compromise here where the court says, "Uh, Colorado, you can't take Trump off the ballot. That's a choice for voters, but we're going to give voters maximum information about whether Trump is, in fact, an insurrectionist by letting that case in Washington, D.C. over his election interference in 2020 go to trial. That's a plausible outcome. We'll see. By the time people listen to this, we may know what the answer is to these questions. The subtitle of Amicus is now Experts Speculate Wildly in Real Time. But do you want to take a quick stab at why it is that at least on the immunity appeal, which I think a lot of us were expecting a couple days ago, the court clearly has had time to think about it and dispose of it if this was going to be simple. Apparently, it's not. Do you have any thought on what the holdup is and what it might portend for the fate of the immunity argument at the court? Well, I remember a few weeks ago, you and Mark kind of gamed out what all the different options are and how weird it is, because there's this uh, different number of justices needed to put the thing on hold to stay it versus to actually agree to hear the case. It's easier to hear the case than to stay it. I think if the court, and here, you know, I'll just go out on a limb and say, uh, if the court was actually going to do what Jack Smith, the special counsel, suggested it do, which is, if you're going to take the case, take it quickly, set it for a quick oral argument, just like is being done with the Colorado case, then we would have heard that already. And nobody would have written a dissent because they could always include their dissent later on when the court rules on the merits. So the longer this goes on, the more it seems to me the court is going to let this thing go to trial. And then somebody, and it rhymes with um, mojito, uh, (laughs) is going to be writing something that is going to say that this is the end of the republic as we know it. I didn't think that's where we were going to be. I thought that the court would actually take it. I and mean, how could they let the DC circuit be the last word? But then I realized, you know, this is an interlocutory appeal. That is, it's an appeal before the trial. The Supreme Court could issue an order saying no stay. And of course, these issues may be presented by Mr. Trump, should he be tried and convicted of these crimes, and we can always address those later. So maybe that's what's going to happen, which would be a good thing. And I think provide the public with the information it will need in order to decide whether or not to re-elect Donald Trump to office for his third term, right? Since he says he won in 2020. Yeah. And, and and certainly not his last term, if things go the way he wants. Um, Justice Mojito's dissent almost writes itself, if the scenario that you posit is the one that's coming. I do want to, before we leave this topic, pivot to something that I feel like you think about as fretfully and as 
meticulously as anyone, which is this legitimacy question. Because what the court is now sitting on is not one, but two, as you noted, related but unrelated hand grenades. There are certainly more to come. And I think, and we'll talk about this in the context of your book, there's going to be a lot to come uh, around the 2024 election. And they're juggling that against a, a crisis of confidence that the polling says a little better than it was in Dobbs in terms of the approval rating, but not much. How many justices of the four, the five, whatever the number is, what number of the justices do you think are thinking about this legitimacy issue as they make their way through what's just going to be a thicket of we're deciding the 2024 election cases? I put in that camp Roberts, obviously, Kavanaugh, Maybe Barrett, who's kind of been a surprise in some ways in terms of her not being with the YOLO justices, who I would say are Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch. Gorsuch is a little different than Alito and Thomas. I think he's probably less predictable on certain things. And you've got to figure the three liberal justices are going to just take whatever they can get in terms of things that further democracy. So it's hard to call them the center of the court because it's so off-center, but Relatively speaking, that is the group that we're looking at. Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch are far to the right. And then you've got this block in the middle of Roberts, Barrett, and Kavanaugh. And then you've got uh, Kagan, Sotomayor, and Jackson to the left. So if you think about it in that way, you know, all the cards are being held by justices that may actually care about the reputation of the court. You know, I was just teaching this week the Bostock case which is the case involving gender identity and, and sexual orientation discrimination, whether they're covered by Title VII. And at the end of Kavanaugh's dissent, he does this Obergefell-Roberts move to say, you know, I'm dissenting, but I congratulate my gay and lesbian friends on their victory here today. I mean, there was really, that was very gratuitous to include that. And, you know, it, it just shows me, you know, how much he's, uh, Kavanaugh is still craving acceptance by the non-Fox News crowd, which is kind of different than where Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch are. So maybe there's some hope that the legitimacy issue makes a difference. And also, I think it's the right thing to do. I mean, let's talk about the merits. People should know whether or not Donald Trump engaged in insurrection, engaged in crimes. The Supreme Court deserves to give us a chance to get the answers to those questions on the merits. I want to ask you one other news question, and then we will turn to your book. But this is more kind of doomsday clock slash election slash money slash Trump news. And there's a lot of campaign finance questions that are swirling in the news this week that seem kind of Hassan worthy. Part of that is can Lara Trump <laughs> drain the RNC coffers to pay off her father-in-law's massive judgments after a pair of big losses in Manhattan? There's, you know, the Stormy Daniels lawsuit, which is at heart a campaign finance case. I, I wonder if you just have some thoughts about where we are in this moment of, you know, we're talking about all these things as unrelated, <laughs> but in some sense, it's all related to if campaign finance laws worked as intended, this stuff wouldn't be so thorny and intractable and awful. It should be a no-brainer that a political party cannot pay the restitution that is owed by a person for committing business fraud. I mean, the whole point of disgorging profits is that you're taking the ill-gotten gains away from the wrongdoer. The whole point of punitive damages, each, remember in the E.G. and Carroll case, it was, I think, over $60 million in punitive damages, is to punish the wrongdoer. Well, if someone else is paying, you're not punishing the wrongdoer. I don't think they're actually going to try to pay these things out of the RNC's coffers or even out of the pack. I think they're going to keep paying the legal expenses. Now... The legal expenses, you think, well, you know, what could they be? $3 million, $4 million. So apparently it's $50 million in legal fees. That Alina fees. Haba, she's I mean, not cheap. Yeah. Trump is doing for the defense bar uh, what he did for the Washington Post <laughs> while he was president. I mean, <laughs> the money is just rolling in because of the, you know, the outrageous conduct. But, you know, th there you go. So to the extent that they actually try and do it, you know, we don't have real-time campaign finance enforcement. I think that's the important point. Like, if this turns out to be a campaign finance violation, well, when will we find that out? Two or three years at the 
Federal Election Commission where they're completely deadlocked on party lines or, uh, you know, a criminal case brought by the Department of Justice when in, in three years? You know, Merrick Garland doesn't seem to move all that quickly when it comes to Trump. That's part of the reason we're in the situation we are right now with this race against the clock. So even if there are campaign finance violations, even if they try and do some outrageous things, it's not like someone could run into court, get an injunction and say, stop allowing Trump to pay the money. That's just not how it works in that area. So remember, the Stormy Daniels payments was, what, 2016? And that's what's now going on trial potentially at the end of March. Right. I was going to say that's the template for how utterly unenforceable this is in real time, is that we just only now are going to get to hear, you know, hours of Michael Cohen saying, oh, yeah, no, we broke all the laws. But it's it's quite a lag time. And the federal government never brought that suit, remember. that was, This is being brought in state court. And I'm quite skeptical. And I, I wrote a piece in Slate. First, I wrote a piece in Slate years ago saying the federal government should bring this case, and then they didn't. And I said, the state government shouldn't bring this case. And of course, they did. So you you know who's listening to me. But um, the problem with the state case is that to turn a misdemeanor into a felony here, you've got to show some underlying crime. And if the underlying crime is violating federal campaign finance law, it's not clear under New York law that you could do that kind of bootstrapping. So You know, I'm not a fan of that case. Big fan of the election subversion case in D.C., but not of this one. And huge fan of the Mar-a-Lago case, which our great-grandchildren will enjoy covering very much. We'll be right back with Professor Rick Hassan talking about his book, A Real Right to Vote. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. We're going to pause now to hear from one of our sponsors on this show, the Baptist Joint Committee and their podcast, Respecting Religion. The wall of separation between church and state is foundational to American democracy. As a listener of Amicus, you know that the Supreme Court is eroding this wall brick by brick. The justices are allowing more government funding of religion and sowing confusion about the proper relationship between religion and government, even in places like public schools where the rules have long been settled. They've stretched to find far-reaching protections for the First Amendment's Free Exercise Clause and brushed aside the protections of the Establishment Clause. You know all this, but what you may not know is how a Baptist group is defending church-state separation and fighting Christian nationalism. The Respecting Religion podcast is hosted by Amanda Tyler and Holly Holman, two Baptist advocates and constitutional attorneys. Listen to the Respecting Religion podcast wherever you get your podcasts. If you're worried about the Supreme Court's decisions on religion, the rise of Christian nationalism, and use of the term religious freedom to harm others, you won't want to miss an episode. So, Rick, one of the primary questions I've taken from your sort of body of work, which, you know, you and I have been thinking things through for a long time now, 
is that we are in some sense always fighting the last election fight and we're just never really great at imagining what's coming. You know, you you predicted and it was true that we would all get bogged down in vote suppression, you know, questions about voter ID and felon disenfranchisement at exactly the moment that straight up democracy subversion was swooping in to take its place. And so I know part of the answer to this question lies in the book and in the, the curatives that the book proposes. But I also just want to ask Before we turn to your book, what is the thing we are not imagining right now with respect to the 2024 contest? And what is the thing that if you could say, hey, hey, you're focusing on old stuff, here's the new stuff, what is the new stuff? Well, that's a great question. I think you're right about the danger of always fighting the last war, which is what seems to me we do. So, you know, is there going to be a storming of the Capitol on January 6, 2025? Pretty doubtful. You know, I think there's going to be good law enforcement presence at the Capitol on that day, should it be necessary. To answer your question, let me go back and tell you what I got wrong in election meltdown. So in election meltdown, I thought the one way that we could avoid this kind of deterioration of confidence in the election process on the right is by holding a really good election where, you know, it's clean, there's not there's not a lot of mistakes, there's no evidence of significant fraud or anything like that. Because I thought if we could actually do that, then that would take the wind out of the sails of any claims of fraud. And when you and I recorded, it was just as COVID was starting, and COVID hits, and it creates these tremendous challenges to our election. And in the end, we ran a great election. I mean, it's really shocking how well the election was run, given what was going on with COVID. And yet, that did nothing to stop the false claims. So now, with something like 70% of Republicans believe that Joe Biden was not legitimately elected. So the mistake I made was thinking that truth would actually prevail. You know, as, even as someone who has been skeptical of the marketplace of ideas, I thought, well, enough people would see that the election was fairly run. So that's not true. So so what I'm worried about this time is like Congress has passed this law called the Electoral Count Reform Act to make it harder to subvert the election, having state legislatures pick alternate slates of electors and all that. But all of these changes, Supreme Court decided Moore versus Harper, this is last spring, rejected the this crazy version of the independent state legislature theory, which would allow state legislatures to appoint electors. But all of these things, for them to work, depends on the idea that people are actually going to follow the law. And they're not just going to use brute force to determine the winner. So let's say that looks like Joe Biden has squeaked by in the Electoral College, but Republicans control both houses of Congress. What's going to stop them from just ignoring the Electoral Count Reform Act and just deciding that Donald Trump has won the election? Um, How much is law going to be constraining at this point? And the transformation, what Donald Trump has done to the Republican Party is really frightening because the Law and Order Party is backing someone who is likely to be convicted of a crime and likely engaged in crimes over a number of years, both in his private life and in his political life. And so if we're going to have lawlessness, then we're really going to be in trouble. And so law may only constrain people who are willing to be constrained by the law. Did that frighten you enough? I was going to say, and this is just an inside baseball election meltdown joke, but I will say, like, roll up that rug of despair and bring in the, like, massive wall-to-wall carpeting of doom, right? Like, this is this is quite scary. Uh, it does lead, of course, to the amazing new book. And I think, you know, one of the things that you go deep on, and this is right, is that, you know, the courts are not going to save us. And you talk about the long sorted history of vote suppression and the ways in which 
The courts have done yeoman's work over and over again, with the exception of a few blips in terms of thwarting the right to vote and also, as you note, thwarting congressional efforts to bolster the ability to vote. And I think in this sense, you argue that the United States is kind of unique among other constitutional democracies in terms of not safeguarding the affirmative right to vote and that the court has kind of worked hand in glove with that. And just as a sort of initial framing question, why is that? Why? Why can't the United States do what you note other constitutional democracies do, which is make this not an issue going into the elections? Yeah. And so it's important to note that in other democracies, they don't have a crisis every four years or every five years, whenever they hold their national elections. They don't think, are we going to be able to successfully count the votes? Are there going to be you know, armies of lawyers massing with their new voting lawsuits? Uh, are we going to have voter suppression? Why is that? And I think the reason I decided to write A Real Right to Vote is I'm tired of having every four years you know, the media calls and says, why is our system so fucked up? And, (laughs) you know, it's like, there's a structural problem. It's not just that we're polarized. They're polarized in other countries too, but their elections are not like this. And so I think a big part of it is that our constitution doesn't guarantee the affirmative right to vote. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you go back to the original constitution, the founders, the founders are always put on this pedestal, they didn't love voting. They didn't give the people the right to vote for president. Fast forward to the 2000 Bush versus Gore case, the Supreme Court confirms you still have no right to vote for president. That is something that the grace of state legislatures give us. Thank you very much. Right? The founders didn't give us the right to vote for Senate. We didn't get that till the passage of the 17th Amendment at the beginning of the 20th century. And for the House, they said, you can vote for the House if you're qualified to vote under state law in your state. So they gave it to the states. And so the Constitution was very anti-democracy. And throughout history, as you said, the Supreme Court was not protective of voting rights. So I'll tell two quick stories. One of Virginia Minor and one of Jackson Childs. Virginia Minor goes to the Supreme Court in the 1870s. She said, look, we just passed the, we had a civil war. We passed the 14th Amendment. It guarantees citizens the privileges or immunities of citizenship. I'm a citizen of Missouri. I'm an adult. They're not letting me vote here. Why? Because I'm a woman. Protect my right to vote. And the Supreme Court said, yes, the all-male Supreme Court, I should say, said, yes, you are a citizen, but privileges of citizenship does not include the right to vote. So go to Missouri. And it took another more than four decades to get the passage of the 19th Amendment. The other story, even worse, Jackson Giles, 1903, goes to the Supreme Court and says, you know, we fought the Civil War past the 15th Amendment that says, if you're going to hold an election, don't discriminate on the basis of race. I'm an adult, citizen, resident, non-felon of Alabama, but Alabama is not letting me register because I'm black. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, you know, that is what the 15th Amendment said, but too bad. There's nothing we can do about it. And it's not until Congress comes in and passes the 1965 Voting Rights Act that we get the actual registration of black voters in Alabama and, and other places like that. And of course, by fast forward to 2013, the Supreme Court says, sorry, the Voting Rights Act, which was once constitutional, no longer is when it comes to requiring states with a history of discrimination like Alabama when they try and discriminate. So the Supreme Court's not been the protector of voting rights, so we're not getting it there. Why not directly in the Constitution? Because we've lost our muscle memory when it comes to amending the Constitution. The last voting amendment to the Constitution came in 1971, before a majority of Americans were even born. Doesn't that make you feel old, Dahlia? I had to look up that statistic. Yes. Yes. Thanks. So 1971, 18 to 21-year-olds who were being drafted into the Vietnam War, uh, they get the right to vote in 1971. We haven't done anything since then. What does it take to amend the Constitution? Two-thirds of each House of Congress three quarters of the states, these are very high bars. It's really hard to do, you know, which raises the question, which we can talk about, like, why am I even proposing this when Democrats can't even pass, you know, a revised Voting Rights Act statute? But the problem is that our Constitution is too hard to amend and that it's old. And so the newer constitutions actually protect voting rights. It's in their constitutions and ours does not have that. 
So we're going to get to the why are you even doing this question, but I want to just give you a chance to put some meat on the bones, Rick, and tell us, because you are very concretely propose what constitutional amendments might look like. Can you just give us, like, walk us through what, if, if we were to do this, if we were to come together as one and amend the Constitution with these extremely hard, high bars that you just laid out? What does it do to deter the mischief that we're seeing in states that are kind of ever bolder and more creative in trying to suppress the vote? So, the, you know, the two villains here are the states and the Supreme Court. And my amendment would address both. As to the states, it would say, first of all, it would say that people have the right to vote for president. So states couldn't take that away. It would change Article 2 of the Constitution that vests in state legislatures the power to choose the matter. So we wouldn't have to eliminate the Electoral College. We could keep the Electoral College. And then in each state, we would just say the winner has to be the winner as chosen by the people, right? So that's one thing we could do. But in addition to guaranteeing the right to vote in all elections for citizen, adult, resident, non-felons, we could talk about those categories too, if you want. Uh, in addition to that right being affirmatively put in the Constitution, it would say a couple of things. One, states can't impose burdensome election laws. And I define that in a much more serious way. So just to give one example, people shouldn't have to wait more than 30 minutes to be able to vote if they're waiting in line on election day. That should be a standard, something like that. So we could talk about burdensome voting rules and states would have incentives to avoid being found liable under this amendment to offer voting opportunities, whether that's vote by mail or early voting, but things that, that allow that. And states would have to treat voters equally. So that's, that's one set of protections. The other is it would essentially take Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, at least as it had been understood before the Supreme Court recently weakened it, and enshrine that in the Constitution. And so the, there would be protection for minority voting rights. So these would be the things primarily that would go after the states. And as to the courts, you know, because we passed the 15th Amendment, and the Supreme Court still didn't do anything about it. Most of our amendments are written in quite general ways. You can't discriminate on the basis of race and voting, and Congress shall have the power to enforce this by appropriate legislation. I get much more detailed. I say, here's courts, how you have to weigh this. Thumb on the scale favoring voters, rather than the current rule, which is thumb on the scale favoring the states. And deference to Congress when it expands voting rights. Not, we're going to hold Congress to a standard that makes Congress come in like a litigant before the Supreme Court and make its case as to why it thinks it has this kind of power. And do you want to just for a minute unpack your categories, your non-felon citizen, like help us help us see that you're not, in fact, offering to enfranchise, you know, every single person who uh, walks the face of the United States of America? So the first thing is that every country in the world imposes some limits on who can vote. So you can't vote in UK elections, right? You're not a citizen. I am not. I can't vote in the Nevada Senate race, even though I have a great interest in who wins that race, right? Because I'm a resident of California. So residency requirements and citizenship requirements are pretty much the norm, as well as adulthood. Uh, you know, we don't let 11-year-olds vote in any country, right? So we can argue about whether it's 16 or 18 or 20 or whatever it's that, but adulthood, uh, mental competency, we can talk about that. That's its own set of interesting issues. Felon disenfranchisement is one of the more difficult ones. I actually support an end to felon disenfranchisement, but I hive that off. What I do in the book, just generally speaking, is I propose a basic amendment, kind of what's the minimum that I think we need right now that would at least preserve the status quo of where the Warren Court was in the 1960s? And then I have these add-ons, one for former felons, one for people who live in U.S. territories like Guam or American Samoa or Puerto Rico or Washington, D.C., one for dealing with the Electoral College and one for dealing with the Senate. And the reason I separate this out is I think that there is, and I'm not talking about in the next two years, but say in the next 20 years, I think that there's a case that there could be a bipartisan interest in an amendment to the Constitution guaranteeing the right to vote, in part because the Republican Party is changing and is appealing more to voters who are poor, who are less educated, who are more likely to be disenfranchised by strict voting rules. So I tried to think, what's the minimum? And then, you know, how would we add to it? So that's why I draw those distinctions. 
So now we have the, I'm waving the book around uh, for listeners, but now we just do inevitably get to the grumpy old man question, Rick, which is how do we possibly get two thirds of both houses, three quarters of the states to like do anything at all in a climate that is inclined to do nothing ever. And as you noted, we can't even get this passed as a matter of statutory protection for the right to vote. And I guess the follow on is, what do you do about a court that even if this were to pass, would just Shelby County it and say, no, we'll let you know what is and is not constitutional? Right. So I think you need to think about a different time horizon. And so I'll go back to the story of Virginia Minor. So when you think about the enfranchisement of women in the United States, you can go back all the way to Abigail Adams. I mean, there have been attempts, you know, and when, we, and when Congress after the Civil War was thinking about the Reconstruction Amendments, there were attempts to try to get women enfranchised in the Constitution that were unsuccessful. So the idea of women enfranchisement is as old as the United States. But the movement really took off after that Supreme Court decision in Minor versus Happersett, when the Supreme Court said, sorry, women, this is a question of state law. So what happened was there was political organizing in the states. And over decades, women and their male allies were able to change 30 state constitutions to guarantee women the right to vote. It was a political movement that was oriented around voting rights and was ultimately successful. So one answer is we need a longer time horizon. Maybe this will be what our children, our grandchildren are going to be dealing with. But I wanted to frame the issue because, you know, we talk about voting rights in a kind of scattershot way where it's like, what's the latest voting lawsuit that's coming up, which is, you know, kind of how we start our conversation, as opposed to thinking about it holistically and, you know, how our system is just systematically messed up. The other point is that organizing around a voting rights amendment will pay dividends along the way. Just like in the 19th Amendment context, women started getting their right to vote in states. The same thing would happen here. And this leads me to the point about the courts. If we actually can get to a point in the United States where there is enough support for a voting rights amendment, the Supreme Court is going to be hard-pressed to push against it, especially, you know, I've written it with the textualists in mind, with very explicit instructions, courts, here's what you have to do. So there'll be less wiggle room. Now, could Sam Alito find that wiggle room? Absolutely. But I'm hoping, if we still have law, that law would actually be applied. And after a while, this would be something that uh, the courts would have to give in on. And the last part of my amendment adds further power to Congress's ability to protect voting rights. And so, you know, that would create a confrontation. And if the court is recalcitrant, well, then that's the time to pack the court. The other thing is, you know, I said that this is kind of a gambit to the right. Like, here's something that I'm proposing that not only promotes voter equality, but also promotes election integrity because it requires voter registration and a form of national ID. I mean, this is something that should please those on the right who claim that they're worried about election integrity and would make stealing elections harder. So if it turns out that there's complete resistance, well, then that's an argument to blow up the filibuster next time Democrats control the presidency of the House and enough of the Senate to get 50 votes for the context of passing voting rights. You know, if we can blow up the filibuster to pass budgets, if we can blow up the filibuster for nominations for executive and judicial officers, how about for democracy? Isn't that as important? That was a pitch I made in Slate back in 2018. And, you know, they couldn't get Manchin and Cinema and some other Democrats, we think, to be able to go along with passage of the For the People Act or the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. But if there is continued resistance to protecting voting rights muscularly in the Constitution, then maybe these other measures could be put out there. And that would be a way to attack both the courts and those who resist voting rights. I love what you're saying, because I think it makes this really important point, which is that people are shocked, and you know this in the book, when they realize they don't actually have the right to vote. They don't have it. It's not protected in the Constitution. And I think they would be equally shocked to know that this absolute blood sport that we go through year after year after year around elections with, you know, lawsuits and 
threats and recounts and vote suppression is not the norm. And that, you know, both those things can be cured. They can be cured with, as you say, a systemic fix that is not that complicated. And I think in some sense, we're so enmeshed in a system where all we do is fight about how elections went, that we forget that A, that's not normal. B, it can be fixed. I do want to ask you one question that I think is a kind of ongoing tension in in your work, which is you often talk about the way that the election system as it exists right now, and again, this is uniquely American in some ways. I think in the book you call the current uh, American election system, quote, dysfunctional, decentralized, and partisan. Sometimes that protects democracy because it's hard to subvert a system that is so decentralized and so reliant on sort of ground up local, even if it's political and partisan. But it's kind of quaint that it's hard to subvert that. It's hard to capture a rickety low tech system. And I would love for you to just give us a beat on how we keep thinking that's the fix. In some ways, I think you'd agree in 2020 that decentralized system was the fix. It's not actually a fix that is sustainable or reliable, right? Well, you know, back in 2012, when I wrote The Voting Wars, I thought we should nationalize, federalize our election administration system. And it's such a non-starter. I still think that's the way to go. Again, look at Canada, Australia, UK. I mean, that's how they run their elections. They have professionals, nonpartisan. You go into a polling place in Winnipeg, it's going to look the same as a polling place in Montreal. The ballot's going to look the same. It's going to be counted the same. I mean, that makes sense. I see the argument that in 2020, if there was a federal election czar, maybe Trump could have tried to pressure that person the way he tried to pressure the legislators in Michigan or in Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia. (laughs) I'm sure the number of states go on. I totally see that. But in the long run, having national, professional, insulated, like the Federal Reserve kind of system would make sense. But that is so far from where the American public is that in my new book, I think I say five times, I am not calling to federalize our elections. I am accepting the idea that we are stuck with a hyper-decentralized election system. And then the question is, how can we assure that In some places, we're not going to have incompetence or attempts to subvert elections or suppress the vote. And so I'm thinking about a decentralized system, but one where there can be certain federal standards, like imposing the Constitution, like you should not have to wait more than a half hour to vote. It should not be that in Georgia, you could wait two hours and no one's allowed to offer you a glass of water unless it's a polling place official. I mean, what kind of BS is that. I mean, that is just not the way to run an election. Even if I think that not giving people water is not going to deter a lot of voting, it's like, this is really what you're going to spend your energy on when you're trying to do election reform. So yeah, we have a decentralized system. It's not perfect, but we can work with it and we can make it a lot better. We're going to pause now to hear from some of our great sponsors on this week's show. We're going to pause for a moment to hear from our friends at SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Hi, this is Harry Littman, the host of Talking Feds, a roundtable discussion on law and politics featuring three special guests every week, and I mean really, really special. Folks like Senators Cory Booker and Amy Klobuchar, government officials Ron Klain and Vanita Gupta, members of Congress Adam Schiff and Katie Porter, journalists Andrea Mitchell and Fareed Zakaria, and many, many more. Oh, and sidebars by folks like Robert De Niro and Jane Lynch and many, many more, and music by Philip Glass. Listen and subscribe to Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts. And now we are back with Professor Rick Hassan. 
I want to ask you to opine on oral argument coming up next week in a pair of cases, Net Choice versus Paxton, Moody versus Next Choice, coming out of the states of Florida and Texas that are trying to enact laws prohibiting social media platforms from moderating content posted by their users. This in normal times, this would be just screeching blockbustery news, but in this attention economy, we're not taking seriously what it is that's on the line. And I'd love for you to sort of sketch out the Texas law, the Florida law, what the question is, and then just flag for listeners, you actually have an amicus brief in the Net Choice Appeal arguing if this goes the way it might go, if these laws are allowed to stand, it's going to have huge implications for democracy and elections and violence. Both Texas and Florida passed laws that limit the ability of big platforms like Facebook or Instagram or X. Do we have to say formally known as Twitter anymore? Or we could just say X. I just call it Twitter. Allow the big platforms to engage in content moderation. Now, I don't know if people realize what would happen if there was no content moderation, but, you know... It would be spam and porn, spam and porn. That's all we would see. And thank God for content moderation because it makes these platforms usable. These laws were passed after Donald Trump was removed from both Facebook and Twitter for be there, will be wild. Remember, Uh, he went to Twitter by New York Times count 400 times between election day and three weeks after, saying the election was stolen or rigged and spreading election lies. And he was removed. And so these states want to stop that. They want these platforms to be thought of as like the phone company. So like if it's Verizon, Verizon can't say, you know what, we're not going to let you talk on the phone. We're not going to give you a phone line because you might say, I love Nazis, right? We don't allow common carriers to discriminate based on people's viewpoints. There's a case, kind of a controversial case, called Pruden Yard that says that shopping areas, that uh, supermarkets need to let people give out flyers, you know, in front of the supermarket. So those who are defending these laws that say, and and they differ in their particulars, but both of them are aimed at at stopping content moderation, especially of politicians like Donald Trump. I mean, that, that was the motivation. These laws are being defended on grounds that the platform's Even though they're private actors, they're like utilities or like the phone company, and therefore you can make them carry speech, and you can't let them moderate the speech. So, you know, if these laws are upheld, Donald Trump wants to lie and say, you know, the election was stolen or the election's about to be stolen, go to the Capitol, these statements would not be removable. And I think the better analogy to what the platforms are doing is that they're like newspapers. They curate content in a way that people can understand what it is that the platform stands for. So if you go to Truth Social, you're going to get a very different view of the world than if you go to Facebook. And there are platforms for Democrats, there are platforms for Libertarians, right? And we know what happened to Twitter when Elon Musk changed his content moderation policies. People left. Advertisers left. You know, like, you don't want to sell soap next to a white supremacist. (laughs) And so people voted with their feet. So so my thinking is, while platforms are not quite like the Wall Street Journal or like the New York Times or Slate, they curate content. And it's the curation that really sends the message. And they, just like the Wall Street Journal or Slate or NBC News, have a First Amendment right to curate that content. There's a a old famous Supreme Court case called Tornillo, where F- Florida, same same state, had required a right to reply in a newspaper. So if the newspaper says something about you, you had the right to reply. You had the right to access to the newspaper's op-ed page. And the Supreme Court said, that's unconstitutional. The newspaper decides. You can always put your speech somewhere else. Now, back when they said that in Tornillo, there was no other place to put your speech. You know, you couldn't go to, because there were fewer chance of communication. Today, you can write a manifesto, you can post it on Facebook, you can plaster it all over the internet. And so what's at stake in these cases is whether or not the platforms are going to be treated as having First Amendment rights 
who are almost like state actors who have to give you access and cannot moderate content. It's a huge deal. And if we were living in normal times, it would be something everybody is talking about. But of course, we're not living in normal times. And so we barely had time to talk about this. We barely have time to talk about this last question, but I want to be really mindful of the fact that our listeners just went through 17 (laughs) different stops on election issues and voting rights issues. And it's a lot. And I want to take you back to something that you and I really think about again, I think, in some sense, it's a spiral we both live in, which is that at the end of the day, the right to vote is only as secure as public confidence that voting works and that their vote matters. We learned this a little bit when we did election meltdown, when some listeners said that we were, in fact, by even talking about what could go wrong in the elections, depressing confidence in voting, when I think we were actually trying to sound an alarm and to at least think through some fixes. So here we are, right? We have just... I think, coughed up a lot of slightly alarming news about things that could go wrong. You've also noted there is a fix. Um, You wrote a book about it. But I wonder if you could just tell listeners who are trying to figure out why they should have confidence in a voting system that, as you've noted in your response to one of my first questions, could just blow up in the face of power and violence. Is there something in particular that listeners should focus on, work on, think about as a win in order to sort of do this split screen work. And I know that's where you live in that split screen of, holy hell, this is scary. A lot of bad things can happen before the 2024 election. And also, here's some stuff that is working that is great and that I would urge people to get involved in doing rather than, you know, moving to Iceland. Iceland seems nice. I mean, besides the volcanoes, but... No, that is that is the wrong answer. Move to Iceland. That's our 2025 show, okay. Rick. <laughs> All right. So back in 2008, uh, or I guess it was early 2009, when Barack Obama was inaugurated, I had a post on the election law blog where I said, you know, pretty remarkable. You had this conservative Republican, George W. Bush, He leaves office after two terms, and Barack Obama, a liberal Democrat, is taking over. He won the election, and the Bushes and the Obamas have coffee together at the White House. They drive over together in a limousine. They shake hands, and Obama wishes Bush well as he flies off in uh, Marine One. And I said, you know, this is a remarkable moment because in this country, we just take for granted our peaceful transitions of power. It's like... Nobody even thinks about our democracy. It just kind of, it, it, it works itself. And I thought, this is a remarkable moment. It's worth taking note of it. Well, nobody is anymore taking for granted our peaceful transitions of power. You know, even during 2020, we were assured, oh, when Trump lost and he's claiming he won, he's just blowing off steam. He'll go away. There won't be anything. And then, like, we find out, oh, he's made 30 calls to state officials trying to change the results. He's using the Department of Justice to try to overturn the results of the election by falsely claiming that there's fraud in Georgia. He's, like, doing all these things behind the scenes. He calls these people to Washington, D.C. to engage in a wild protest as Congress is counting the Electoral College votes. We are awake now. So that is a good thing. The American people are not going to take this lying down. And I talked about, in, in an answer to one of your earlier questions, that we have to worry about actual lawlessness. Well, if there's actual lawlessness, if people in Congress try to declare the election loser the winner, then that's going to be a moment to take to the streets. That's a moment when, you know, the the people need to protect democracy. Sometimes it's the courts, sometimes it's Congress, sometimes it's the people. And so my message is one of vigilance. It's not one of optimism, but it's one of vigilance. It's to say, look, you know, the system is in danger. It's in danger in a way that I never expected it would be in the United States. It really surprised me what's happened to the deterioration of democracy in the United States in the last decade. But we're awake. We know that lots of things could be done. There are groups out there. Uh, I listened to uh, an episode you had 
a couple of months ago with Ian Basson of Protect Democracy. There are real American heroes out there who are looking to protect our democracy. We have a decentralized system. There are lots of places to get involved. It's very easy to turn off the podcast and not listen because it's too depressing. That's what I do when I hear something about climate change. I just, you know, can't deal with it, you know, but we've got to do something to be prepared to protect our democracy should it be necessary. And so pay attention, get involved, especially in your local area, because in our decentralized system, you can have some ability to ensure that free or fair elections are happening in your local area. And you have listeners all over. Go out and see what's actually happening in your communities. I, I love what you're saying, Rick, because it dovetails with, I think, some of the messaging we had to think through post-Dobbs, where there was this, like, wait, it's not going to happen. It's not. <gasps> it happened. And then, I, you know, I think I'll lie down and sob. And I think that there is some utility when the scales fall off your eyes. Um to realizing that the thing was not, as you said, self-effectuating. It was not made of magic, but also that it's a moment to step up and bolster uh, the weak parts. And one of the reasons your book is really, I think, a nice read right now is that this stuff is not unfixable. It's eminently fixable. And it's just always good to have guidance from people who've been thinking about this as long as you have. Rick Hassan teaches law and political science at UCLA, directs UCLA Law School's Safeguarding Democracy Project, helms the absolutely indispensable election law blog. The brand new book is called A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. And it dropped this week. Rick's prior books include Election Meltdown, Cheap Speech, and The Voting Wars. It is always a pleasure, although very eye-opening and always <laughs> slightly alarming ways to talk to you, Rick. Congratulations on the book. And thank you so, so much for this incredibly, I think, useful and centering work. Thank you, Jolly. And I, I want to say that, you know, I end A Real Right to Vote with the line, democracy is not going to protect itself. And you've been out there sounding the alarm, making sure that we know that the future of American democracy is in our hands. Aw, aw, thank you. And that's a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in. And thank you so very much for your letters and your questions and your feedback. You can keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. Or you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Sara Burningham is Amicus's senior producer. Our producer is Patrick Fort. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We will be back with another episode of Amicus next week. And until then, hang on in there.